D.C. area office of the Rouge Pack on the, the Rouge Pack science team. And uh, I'd like to start by underscoring um, the, what was really a major theme in Ken's briefing and presentation, which is the crucial point about today's global strategic situation. And that is, you know, look at what is actually happening in Eurasia. You look at the fact that over the past two to three decades, China has lifted 600 million people out of poverty. That's almost twice the current U.S. population. And I, I looked this up. This is more than 15 times the population of Canada. Um, you look at the fact that over the past couple of years, China has established a new development bank, the Asia Infrastructure Develop uh, Investment Bank, which currently has 70 member nations, including many nations of Europe, and by the end of the year expects to have 30 more. The AIIB is a uh, development bank with no conditionalities, explicitly to make loans to development projects to facilitate China's One Belt, One Road and, and sister projects. Now, think about these projects. We, we didn't talk about any of them explicitly today, but you, you can find out much more. Just, just think about the scale of the projects that are currently underway or, or will very shortly be underway in Eurasia. For example, last year we had the opening of an upgraded rail line which runs from the city of Chongqing in China, which is just south of the ancient city of Xi'an, the beginning of the Silk Road. It runs from there in central China, west through the desert of China. It runs through nations in Central Asia, such as Kazakhstan. It runs through a part of Russia. It runs through countries in Eastern Europe, like Poland, all the way into Germany to the western part of Germany and ends in the industrial city of Duisburg. Now, can you imagine that in your mind, right? And that's just one of many projects. Just this year, China opened a rail link between um, China and Tehran. Now, that's complementary to other projects which are just getting underway. For example, there was just an agreement signed between Iran, India, and Afghanistan. Now, think for a moment about the condition of Afghanistan. There was just a joint agreement signed to develop a new port in the city of Chabahar, which is in the southeast of Iran, right on the Gulf of Oman. Now, this is going to be a maritime connection between India and other nations on the Indian Ocean, up into a rail link going from Chabahar to the border of, of Iran and Afghanistan, opening up Afghanistan to be developed, to have access to trade to have access to rail connections up into central Eurasia. There are many, many more I could mention. India just announced they're going to begin um, a plan for, the develop uh, for water transfer programs <coughs> among five major rivers in India. This is something which has been on the books for decades, which Mr. LaRouche talked about in the 1980s. India just announced that they're um, about to begin this kind of water management uh, large-scale water management project. It's akin to the projects which are happening just over the Himalayas in China with their south to north water transfer project. So I, I can name many, many more, but I wanted to describe some of them so you let your imagination picture this growing, very rapidly growing integration of the nations and the peoples of Eurasia around the policy of peace of development. That is what these missile installments in Eastern Europe of NATO, of, of soldiers from the United States, from, from Germany, from other nations, that is what these war policies are being deployed to stop, right? This, the idea that a new system could come into being which is outside of geopolitics, and which is outside of the control of the British Empire, where nations are acting on their common interests, common benefits, meaning that all of those trigger points of geopolitics are being dissolved. 
anything that could have been used as a lever to set one people against the other is now in the process of being eliminated. That's what the British Empire wants to stop. That's what Obama is deploying to stop. That's what the, the, the head of NATO and all of his insanity is deploying to stop. It's nothing about the nations of China or the nation of Russia per se. And they're deploying to stop this even at the risk of unleashing thermonuclear war on the planet. Now that's insane. And you know, any normal person would say, why? Why? Why would they do that? What warrants the possible extinction of mankind? But this tendency represented by the British Empire and their lackey Obama, this tendency within civilization of oligarchy and the, the, the commitment to maintaining the system of oligarchy is not new. This is not a creature of the 20th or 21st century. This is something which is very ancient within mankind. And you have a very clear um, a very clear image and expression of this conflict between man, mankind, and oligarchy in the story of Zeus and Prometheus. The, the myth that comes to us from ancient Greece, which isn't really a myth at all. And Matt, you can put the first slide up on the screen there. So here you see, um, Okay, here you see, uh, on the left, you see Prometheus, the fire bringer. And on the right, you see Zeus reclining on his throne with his foot on uh, the eagle, which is the symbol of Zeus. And as most people are probably familiar with, with the story, but just to kind of reiterate it, Zeus was the king of the gods of Mount Olympus, the king of the immortals. And he came to power by overthrowing his father, Kronos, with the help of Prometheus, who, uh, Prometheus who wanted to end the tyranny of Kronos. Now, Zeus hated mankind. And um, as it's put by the playwright Aeschylus in his, um, in his play, Prometheus Bound, he describes this in the mouth of Prometheus. Prometheus says, of wretched mortals, humans, of wretched mortals, Zeus took no notice. He desired to bring the whole race to an end and to create a new one in its place. And against this purpose, none dared to make sand except me. I only had the courage. I saved mortals so that they did not descend, blasted utterly to the house of Hades. This is why I am bent by such grievous tortures, painful to suffer, piteous to behold. And so Prometheus saved mankind by stealing fire from Mount Olympus. Fire, which was the privilege only of the gods, and he brought it to mankind. And that's what you see depicted in the, in the image there, is Prometheus stealing the fire from Mount Olympus. Um, now, what is fire? What, what is it more broadly? What do we mean by that? Um, so I, I'd like to read, because I, I think it's um, the most poetic description. I'd like to read um, what Prometheus says that fire is. Um, in Aeschylus' play. Now at this point, Prometheus has been punished by Zeus by being, uh, in the form of being chained to a rock uh, for eternity to have his liver eaten out every day by the eagle of Zeus um, and to be under perpetual torment. So uh, Prometheus is visited by many people who say, you know, didn't, didn't you overstep your bounds? Shouldn't you apologize? You wouldn't have to go through all this if, if you just apologized to Zeus. And Prometheus refused. But he says, he says of mankind and of um, the nature of fire, he says this. He says, listen to the miseries that beset mankind, how they were witless before I, uh, before, and I made them have sense and endowed them with reason. 
First of all, though they had eyes to see, they saw to no avail. They had ears, but they did not understand. But just as shapes in dreams, throughout their length of days, without purpose, they wrought all things in confusion. They had neither knowledge of houses built of bricks and turned to face the sun, nor yet of work in wood. But they dwelt beneath the ground like swarming ants in sunless caves. They had no sign either of winter or flowery spring or a fruitful summer on which they could depend. But they managed everything without judgment until I taught them to discern the risings of the stars and their settings, which are difficult to distinguish. Yes, and number two chiefest of sciences I invented for them, and the combining of letters, creative mother of the muse's arts, with which to hold all things in memory. Language. I too first brought brute beasts beneath the yoke to be subject to the collar and the pack saddle, so that they might bear in men's stead their heaviest burdens. And to the chariot I harnessed horses and made them obedient to the rain. It was I and no one else who invented the, the mariner's flaxen-winged car that roams the sea, the ship. Uh, wretched that I am, such are the arts that I have devised for mankind. And then there's some more dialogue. And then he says, he adds to that, if, if ever men fell ill, there was no defense no healing food, no ointment, but for lack of medicine they wasted away until I showed them how to mix soothing remedies with which they now ward off their disorders. Now as to the benefits to men that lay concealed beneath the earth, bronze, iron, silver, and gold, who would claim to have discovered them before me? No one I know full well, unless he likes to babble idly. Hear the sum of the whole matter in the compass of one brief word. Every art possessed by man comes from Prometheus. And the name Prometheus means forethought. So uh, you see this full idea of fire, right? language, agriculture, metallurgy, uh, travel of the sea, astronomy. With this gift, with this fire, man is no longer an animal. He's a creator. And with that, man is not a subject of nature, but he becomes a power in and over nature to reshape it in a way which would have been impossible without the intervention of mankind, to transform nature and create new elements, create new forms of existence which nature could not have achieved on its own. So one quick example, if you want to pull up the second slide, Matt, is metallurgy. So on the left, you see uh, the mineral malachite. And on the right, you see copper. So malachite is a hard, you know, kind of glassy, if you polish it, a glassy rock. And Copper, as we know, uh, is a metal. It's a very pliable, flexible, flexible metal. It conducts electricity well and has other care. You wouldn't think that one came from the other. So, ancient, many thousands of years ago, through the process of chemistry, how to extract copper from this green glassy rock called malachite. Um, the process isn't so important to describe here. But you have the transformation of one so-called found element in this mineral into something completely new, with completely different physical characteristics, powers, and uses for mankind. Um, take another quick modern example, which we'll return to uh, in a certain way later, is man's current control over a new form of fire, which is the fire of the atomic nucleus, nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. 
And with this power, the fact that we're able to manufacture new elements, to manufacture new isotopes of currently existing elements, which have completely different powers and properties than before. Uh, isotopes which have use in industries, in making very special metal alloys, which are stronger or more flexible or more, you know, more useful than before. Also, incredible uses in medicine. Isotopes which are manufactured for medical diagnostics, for cancer treatment, and so forth. Chemistry couldn't do that. Nuclear fission and fusion can. So, this, these things that we call resources, right? This, this stuff, <laughs> so-called, that, that, we, that we use to maintain our existence on the planet, these things are not found. Ever since the gift of fire, these things were not, you know, things that man just stumbled over, like Obama talked about, we found some wood and we used it to stab each other, right? <laughs> but but that's, that's not it. Resources for man are not found, they're creations. They're original creations of man which change over time as a function of uh, the, the hot principles and the process of not only the use of fire, of, uh, of to the use of, of a fire, which allows to exert greater powers of productivity in and over nature. That process is human, right? That process is Promethean. And that's the process which you, which you see, at least in a kind of an embryonic form or a potential form, that's the process that you see shaping up in Eurasia around the leadership of China, Russia, the BRICS countries. So. That's where the Promethean um, policy lies today. So what does that make Obama? What does that make the Queen of England? Zeus, right? Today, the British Empire is the embodiment of the Zeusian oligarchy that we still have not rid ourselves of after all these many thousands and thousands of years. And that's why Obama cannot help but respond the way that he does to these developments in the world. That's why he can't but help lie about what China is or is not doing in the South China Sea. And that's why he couldn't help himself with the comments, those disgusting comments that he made in Hiroshima uh, you know, about, about the, the history of man being about killing. But I wanted to actually um, zero in on something even more explicit, the, the Zeusian Act, which is even more explicit uh, by Obama. And that is that in 2010, um, when he was, he had only been in the presidency for uh, just over a year, Obama made a speech in Florida at the, the Kennedy Space Center, where he announced the cancellation of the US space program. Now, at that moment, LaRouche called for Obama's impeachment, which he hadn't done before, despite the fact that the Hitler health care program uh, had already begun or, or had already been introduced. But it was at that time that LaRouche said, all right, no more. This guy has to be impeached. I see where this is headed. Now, at that time, in 2010, the United States, and a lot of people in the United States don't know this, uh, in 2010, the United States had already, for five years, been um, mobilizing for a return to the moon. Now, the United States has not won, in no country, the United States has not been to the moon since the 1970s. And we've actually, since that time, we've completely lost the, um, the machine, we've completely lost the ability to go to the moon. We cannot go to the moon today. Actually, it's worse. We can't even put our own people into orbit today. Um, but, but I mean, that's that's pretty incredible. The nation that landed on the moon, that, that, that developed the Saturn V rocket, this enormous, incredible rocket that they thought all of the um, 
machinery and people into orbit and then off to the moon and then back. You know, the, these rockets, they're the only two that I know of that are left, maybe there are three, um, are museum pieces. And so we have completely lost that. But, but starting in 2005, NASA was under a mobilization to restore that, cap that, that capacity with modern technology. We were developing a new family of rockets called the Atlas rockets. We were developing a new lunar lander. We were developing a new um, crew command module that could hold up to six people for, for lunar and then possibly deep space travels. And Obama destroyed it. And um, just to underscore the point, here's what he said in that speech. Now, I understand that some believe that we should attempt to return to the surface of the moon first, as previously planned. But I just have to say pretty bluntly here, we've been there before. <laughs> now, um, so with that act, Obama cut mankind, but at least you know, Americans and the West, cut us off from the future. He ended, in effect, ended the future. Now, you know, why say that? As, you know, aside from sort of science, you know, kind of a hand wavy science fiction, all the space is the future. Why say that? Why is, is man in space necessary for the future? You know, well, why, why isn't there just plenty of future here on Earth? You know, a lot of people say, oh, the oceans are so unexplored, and that's true. But, you know, why space? Why do we have to go out into the solar system? There are practical things you could say, such as the fact that we will run out of resources on Earth. I mean, that'll happen in a very long time, but, but it will happen, right? The Earth is a finite body. But even aside from those seemingly more practical things, the more important thing is that mankind is not and was never really ever an earthbound species. Not even from the beginning. I mean, even ancient man began science with astronomy. Um, that, that was the first science. Now, but more recently, this fact that man is not an earthling in, in his essential nature. This was recognized by the great Johannes Kepler. You know, it was Kepler who, from Earth, discovered that the Earth and the solar system are a physical system, right? That astronomy is a physical science. These are physical things. And that the solar system itself is organized um, and constructed according to certain principles of coherence that we find in their most advanced form in polyphonic music. Now, this was also recognized, this extraterrestrial nature of man, it was also recognized by the great Russian scientist Vladimir Vernadsky, who wrote a really fun paper in 1925 called Human Autotrophy. Um, and he begins that paper by saying this, there exists now on a terrestrial surface a great geological force, perhaps cosmic. This force does not seem to be a new manifestation or special form of energy, nor yet a pure and simple expression of known energy, but it exerts a profound and powerful influence on the course of energetic phenomena on the Earth's surface, and consequently has repercussions, smaller but undeniable, beyond the surface, on the existence of the planet itself. This force is human reason, the directed and controlled will of social man. So, Vernadsky, who was, you know, who, who studied the Earth's geochemistry, right? He recognized immediately that that the, the reason, the, the the thought of man, was the most powerful, you know, force, so to speak, exerted on the surface of the Earth. But that it wasn't truly of the Earth; it was cosmic. 
Now, the other person who recognized this true destiny of man as an extraterrestrial species was the great Promethean Kraft Erika. Um, Kraft Erika was a German who was um, one of the, the incredible scientists responsible for the German rocket program. But uh, after World War II, or maybe even during, uh, no, it was after World War II, came to the United States and was one of the Germans who helped to found the U.S. space program. And in 1957, the same year as the Russian Sputnik, Kraft Erika wrote something called uh, the Anthropology of Astronautics. But think about this, no man had ever been into space. Um, but already Kraft Erika is developing the philosophy of space travel. And he says, he, he, he iterates in that work three, what he calls the three fundamental laws of astronautics. But, I mean, I would, I would say that they're really the three Promethean laws of astronautics. So he says, number one, nobody and nothing under the natural laws of this universe impose any limitations on man except man himself. Number two, not only the Earth, but the entire solar system and as much of the universe as he can reach under the laws of nature are man's rightful field of activity. And number three, by expanding throughout the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. So, I'd like to look more at what the issue is. Now, the U.S. under the leadership of Kraft, Erica, and others, the base pro of people who created it, but they had to what we were going to achieve after Apollo, but many hundreds of years into the future. The U.S. space program is no longer Promethean. It limps along trying to, to eke out some kind of existence from a, a totally destroyed um, budget, a totally, you know, with no support. The space program today that is Promethean mm -hmm. is in China. Now, China didn't begin their space program until the 1990s. And um, they very, very rapidly developed the capability to safely put people into orbit, to perform spacewalks. They're in the process of building a space station. They've um, figured out how to create complex communications systems in space and in orbit. And since 2007, China has had very active, uh, has played a very active role both at and on the surface of the moon. Um, you can go to the next slide there. Uh, so in 20, uh, 2007 and in 2010, China sent orbiters to the moon, which orbited, they mapped the moon, they mapped the resources of the moon, they um, experimented with capabilities like getting in and out of lunar orbit. Um, one of the spacecraft uh, and, uh, actually left lunar orbit, met up with an asteroid, <laughs> and is now in, a, in orbit around the sun. But then in 2013, China did something which totally captured the imagination of the world. Um, and that was what you see here. China landed on the moon. Not with people yet, with machinery. Um, but this hasn't been done since 1976, and China did it, and they did it uh, with their own, you know, Chinese nationally developed capabilities. So what you see here is the lander, the Chang'e 3 lander, um, which uh, landed on the moon in December 2013, and if you go to the next slide, um, the lander actually carried on top of it a rover which the rover is what took that picture of the lander. Um, 
and the, the rover is named Jade Rabbit U2. Um, so this, this um, capacity, the, the rover is only semi-functional now, um, but this, the Chang'e 3 a lander and rover has been operational on the moon for almost three years, has sent back incredible pictures of the Earth's plasma sphere, is performing ultraviolet astronomy from the surface of the moon. Um, the, the rover has radar to see below the, uh, to see 100 meters below the surface of the moon. Um, so this is incredible, and this program has inspired total optimism within the Chinese and especially within the And I think it's very telling that there was a poll in the Chinese youth. The Lunar Program, 2,000 that I was able to be traveled to the moon one day. Now, to Obama's you know, uh, uh, you, know you, you can you can trap like oh we've been there you know we should go do other things. We have no idea what the moon is. We haven't been there since 1976. There have only been a handful of robotic missions to the moon, um, just a handful. Um, we have no idea how the moon. <coughs> There are, you know, there, are, there are theories. We have no idea how it forms. We have no idea what's really occurring under the surface of the moon. Um, we have no idea what the moon experiences with the solar system and the galaxy. And at the very evidence, you know, the little moon rocks, the little bit of data that surprises us. And you know, just for the Chinese rover, um, even with I think it was only it was just a couple of months of signal, this rover already discovered we had never seen before. You know, it was um, a physical formation of the moon. And another example is that um, the the lunar that trans. This is still being tested today. I mean, that's all we have, you know, so they're still testing it today. I mean, there's already evidence that the things that have been happening on the moon, like um, significant volcanic activity that we didn't know about before, and it's possibly coordinated with volcanic activity on Earth, right? So we are far, far, far from unlocking the secrets of the moon. And, you know, I said that we've had a handful of robotic missions to the moon. There have only been six manned missions to the moon. Okay, this was fifth. This has been 50 years almost, uh, just short of 50 years, and we've only been sent people to the moon six times. They've only explored five percent of the moon's surface. Um, so you know, th this thing is a totally tantalizing mystery, which is not only going to tell us, you know, about the moon. It's going to tell us things we never knew about the Earth, and it's going to tell us things that we never knew or could have known from Earth about the rest of the solar system and the galaxy. And um, you know, the real point of the mystery, the real, um, you know, there are thousands of things you could investigate on the Moon, but one of the most exciting mysteries is the counterpoint between the near side and the far side of the Moon. So if people don't know, um, from Earth, we always see the same hemisphere of the moon. So it, it, because the, the moon rotates on its, on its axis mm -hmm. at the same rate that it rotates around us, we always see the same mm -hmm. side of the moon. And it wasn't until 1959 when the Soviets sent the orbit <coughs> and got his first glimpse of the far side of the moon in photographs. Um, so Matt, if you pull up the next slide. So do you see, um, I think if you see, you see, um, on the other side of the moon, 
that's what you, what people have been seeing from Earth for, uh, okay. on the right you see the far side of the moon. So already you can tell they look very different, right? You have all these dark patches on the near side of the moon, which are the result of volcanic activity. You have almost none on the far side, and we have no idea why. Um, if you go to the next slide, you see a map of the topography of the moon. And you can see here again that the topography of the near side and the far side are very, very different. The near side is, is you know, somewhat flat. The far side has what are called the, the lunar highlands, these red portions, and it also has one of the deepest craters in the solar system, the, the South Pole Aitken Basin. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the huge mysteries, and I don't have slides of it, but there are other characteristics which aren't necessarily visible to the eye, which differentiate the far side and the near side. For example, the far side of the moon is a very, very unique spot for this trap. And it's that it always faces the Earth. And so it's all Uh, just keep uh, on your side, uh, just mute yourself so we can still see you. And now we can hear you on my phone. Galaxy. 
Now, you know, it's a funny kind of fuzzy spot in the sky. That's what we can see with telescopes like the Hubble telescope. But in the 1990s, we looked at the same galaxy with new telescopes that could see in the radio wavelength. And that's what the, the thing on the right is what we saw of the Hercules galaxy. Now, you see these, these huge plasma structures, which are only visible in radio uh, wavelengths, which completely dwarf the size of what we thought was the galaxy before. And this is forcing a complete crisis, forcing a complete um, reconsideration of the processes of uh, formation and activity of galaxies. So these are the we have no idea what we're going to see in these other wavelengths. Those are the kinds of um, things that are going to be opened up in, uh, by, by you know, taking up this question of the counterpoint between the near side and the far side of the moon. Now, mankind has never been to the far side of the moon. The Apollo landings were all on the near side. And no machinery has ever landed on the far side of the moon. But China is going there in uh, less than two years from now, in 2017. So, um, no, I'm sorry, in 2018, um, they're landing on the far side of the moon. And they've invited all nations to work with them. Now, uh, one other aspect of the moon, and the far side in particular, but with the moon in general that I wanted to raise, is that it has been known since the 1980s that the moon is a very unique vehicle of uh, one of the most powerful fuels that we know of in the universe. And that is that for billions of years, the sun has been depositing a very rare isotope of helium called helium-3 in the soil of the moon. Now, helium-3 is the most advanced fuel kind of nuclear fusion that we're aware of. And um, so fusion, you know, for people who might not be familiar, fusion is um, a power over the atomic nucleus, where as opposed to a fission reaction, like, like happens in, in nuclear power plants today, uranium or plutonium or something, as opposed to a fission reaction, where we split the atom apart and harness the immense energy that comes from that. With fusion, we put two elements together. And fusion is something which we're still struggling to master today. Uh, that's a whole other story, it's a whole other presentation. But fusion is um, both quantitatively and qualitatively immensely more powerful than fission. Um, it's 100, each reaction is 100 times more powerful than the, the fission reaction. And it's 100,000 times more powerful than fossil fuel. Um, now, we can pull up the next slide. So helium-3, that's that is a special isotope of helium-4. There's a normal helium that's so visible and uh, other things today. Um, so helium-3 and helium-4 uh, behave identically chemically, right? You could fill your balloon with helium-3 and helium-4 and you wouldn't know the difference. It, it, it chemically interacts the same. But helium-3 does something very unique in fusion reactions. You can go to the next slide. Um, so, uh, here are four different types of fusion reactions, uh, going from the top to the bottom. And I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's a lot on this graphic, but um, fusion can occur between many different combinations of atoms. Um, so, the most common one that's being worked on today is um, a reaction between two isotopes of hydrogen, and that's what you see on the top, deuterium and tritium. If you look at the very bottom, a reaction between 
deuterium, which is a type of hydrogen, and helium-3 is actually, per reaction, gives a higher energy yield than any other of the, the known or successful views of reaction. And the, the results of the product are also very different than the products that come from other fusion reactions. Um, I'm not going to, just for time purposes, I'm not going to get into the details uh, today, but the, the, the products of a helium-3 reaction are very interesting because they can be contained within the magnetic field as opposed to the neutrons that come from other reactions, which means a lot of things, including that um, the products of the helium-3 reaction can be used in a nuclear rocket for propulsion, which has the potential to take us very quickly, far, far, far uh, away from the surface of the Earth or the Moon in time periods which are practical distance travel. Now, okay, great. Helium-3, great. Why do we have to go to the Moon, right? I mean, number one, we haven't even mastered fusion yet. But number two, why don't we just use helium-3 on the Earth? Well, guess what? There is almost none on the Earth. There's very, very little helium-3 on the Earth. So there's a lot of it on the Moon. And so, you, I mean, I think you, you have to have this image that the Moon is, is beckoning us, you know? It's, it's hinting to us that, um, you know, that, that, that the best, most advantageous place for us to master fusion might not even be the Earth. It might be the Moon itself. And the Chinese are listening to this. They're, number one, they're graduating 2,000 fusion scientists in the next couple of years. Um, and number two, they, they're very publicly dedicated to developing the helium-3 resources on the moon, which we think are more abundant on the far side. So, I mean, this, this is a Promethean man. You know, man realizing this extraterrestrial characteristic, the fact that our minds can conceptualize and have mastery over processes that are, that are not just Earth-bound processes, but which represent um, a foothold on another planetary body, the moon, but also that as um, kind of a base camp, a, a, a launching point for further um, for opening up the questions, or presenting to us new mysteries, which we could not see from the Earth, new mysteries, which are going to be able to you know, open the human mind to making discoveries of higher forms of fire, higher principles, principles that are governing not just the solar system, but the galaxy. That's a Promethean uh, commitment. And so I'll just end by, you know, imagine if the West joined China in this venture. You know, imagine if we got rid of Obama and if we locked the clean up in the zoo. You know, imagine if we did this and the United States would transform like that, right, which would be good for the whole world, <laughs> right? The United States could, could um, revive these capabilities within NASA, which aren't lost, right? They, they could be very rapidly restored. You know, and then imagine Canada. You know, Canada has an incredible capability in space. You have astronauts like Chris Hatfield, who totally inspired the population. And you also have incredible uh, contributions that have already been made to the International Space Station, um, also to Fusion. You have a, a, a fusion company in Western Canada called General Fusion that's making important contributions. So you, know, you, you imagine, really let your mind, your imagination go, and imagine what it would be like if the West would eliminate this goofy tendency and make the decision that we want to join this kind of promethean future. This has never happened before. All of mankind has never been united on a common principle before. You know, that, that's, really, that's our future. So I think I will end there. We're we'll not going to be running out of time, but I think we have time for a couple questions. Okay, thank you very much.
very much, Megan. Um, so we do have time for maybe 10 minutes of questions if people have any thoughts. There was a lot addressed in the course of that presentation. It's not really a question, that's one of our, our contexts, it's just admiring you, the comparison that you made between Zeus and, and Prometheus. I, I think, though, Megan, that uh, <coughs> your presentation was very, very inspiring and straightforward. I, I don't think that there's, I think people have a lot to think about. Okay. I have a question. Oh, wait, we have one, one question here from Tim, and then actually one from Brigitte. So, okay. forget what I just said. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi. Um, we know that China just made some huge breakthroughs in diffusion uh, just this year with their capabilities of you know, holding a plasma together for about 102 seconds. Do you know how the United States is responding to this? Are there still um, fusion capabilities that are still alive in the country? And how are they thinking about these breakthroughs? Yeah. Okay, yes, um, there are absolutely still fusion capabilities. Um, we have a pretty robust, although underfunded, national land system here. And one of our national, well, several, but um, one of our national labs is dedicated to fusion research called Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory. And that's in Princeton, New Jersey, almost Albert Einstein. And um, Princeton, actually, they, they made some of the most incredible breakthroughs in fusion in the 1980s, and or late 70s, 80s, and then up through the early 90s, when their funding was like totally undermined. And, um, but today, Princeton actually has a really close collaboration with um, Chinese, China, with the Chinese fusion program. And so I know that they sent out you know, congratulatory messages um, both Princeton and the Haitei Fusion Center in China, they're both working on tokamak fusion, which is the same um, configuration. And so there's a lot of, of exchange and interchange, but yeah, in terms of, it's just kind of stymied, you know, the funding has been cut and cut as a deliberate policy, and so um, these national labs are sort of maintaining, um, like Princeton has like one project that they've been able to hold on to. Um, and they're, they're sort of treading water, maintaining it, but the support just simply isn't there to really make the breakthrough. So, you know, I would, say, I would just think that a certain, like, you know, potential waiting to be unleashed that was in the United States. Uh, Megan, on that note, I have a question as well regarding the, um, the, the clampdown on science between uh, U.S. Uh, space scientists like NASA and uh, the Chinese Space Agency. And I was wondering if there's any advancement that you know of to overcome those obstacles on the one hand, and also to where did they come from? Have, they, have there always been such a, such a legal firewall between collaboration on space technology between these two countries, or is that a more recent thing? No, that's more recent. Uh, it really came in, I think the ban, so right now, um, because of the special genius of the U.S. Congress, um, U.S. state and NASA is not allowed to work directly with China's, with Chinese space scientists. There can be no bilateral cooperation. And um, it's sort of under the excuse of, well, China's, the rockets of China's space program are managed by the Chinese military, and so, we don't want to help the enemy. Um, so that was a sheer idiocy. And it, it didn't come in. I think it came in in 2006 or something. It, it's quite recent. Um, now, is this progress? No. <laughs> the, the main sponsor of that 
measure in the Congress is, is no longer in Congress, but some new idiots have stepped in to fill his role. Um, no, there's no progress in reversing that. Everybody within NASA thinks it's totally stupid, including the head of NASA. Um, but nothing's being done. But, but, but the only way to fix that is to impeach Obama. Get Obama out of there, that will change. This will be the uh, this will be the last question. Yeah. So can I make a? Oh wait, maybe two questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm from the older generation, and I remember when uh, we were first sent to the moon, the optimism even in Germany, and you would ask any little boy, he would say he would like to become an astronaut, and. Uh, at that time, I had no idea really what uh, could grow out of going to the moon with technology and um, e economy and all this. But uh, now um, I see in China this excitement to go to the moon and how they have like hundreds and thousands of young people who are the scientists. And I see how much uh, we have been dumped down here in the West. And uh, so I uh, just hope that uh, we will be all inspired eventually by uh, the Chinese, you know, to, to overcome this. Thank you. Yeah. I have no question. I just want to just say this. Hi, Megan. Uh, I have not been really following a lot of what's going on when it comes to exploring the space, but I would like to ask you about Russia's uh, role in all that, because you said the Chinese um, you know, ask other countries to join their efforts. So what, where does Russia stand in all that? Like, is there any uh, you know, partnership or alliance between Chinese and Russians? And if you can you just give us a general overview of that. Yes, yes, great question. There absolutely is, um, I don't know a lot of the details, but um, the Chinese space program and the Russian space program have certain cooperation agreements. Um, Russia is, is, um, is tricky, it's a little bit tricky with space. Uh, Russia is a very significant power um, in, in space exploration. Um, people may know that, you know, since the United States decided we want to destroy our space shuttle and we, we can't put our own astronauts into space, we pay Russia so that our astronauts can, can go on their rockets and go up to the space station. Um, so we completely rely on Russia. Um, and I'm sure people know historically, um, you know, Russia and the U.S. were in the so-called space race. But, you know, I mean, Russia, you know, Russia has incredible capacity. They, they were the first... Um, you know, get push and get to the moon, um, which a lot of, but since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and then especially since the looting policy that occurred under George Bush Sr. and Margaret Thatcher in the 1990s, Russia's space industry was totally gutted. It was totally destroyed. Um, the, the people left because there was nothing for them. Uh, the scientists moved to the West. Um, the machinery and, and, the, and the industry were literally taken <laughs> out of the country, looted by carpet, you know, carpet bagging, so to speak. Um, so it's been a long road for Russia to restore that, and they've had a lot of problems with rocket launches. Um, not the man, not the manned rocket launches, but a lot of their um, cargo and satellites. Um, they, they've had some problems with that, but, but they're, they're rapidly recovering. And Putin has actually um, gone through a whole, he put into effect a, a reorganization of what Cosmos, which is the name of the Russian space program, um, to sort of, you know, re-centralize it, get it back together. So that's why I say Russia's a little bit complicated, but they are, you know, they, 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 are, they are absolutely a crucial power, and they do cooperate with China. Okay, thank you very much, Megan. Okay, thank you. Okay, so. It's now 12.20. Um, 
We're only five minutes over our schedule, which is great. Uh, there's going to be a, a lunch break that we're going to have here until 1 o'clock, maybe 1.05, where we'll re reconvene back for uh, two panels. We're going to have a science panel featuring um, myself going through why the fear of radiation is deadly. Not, the, not radiation, but why the fear of radiation is deadly. <laughs> Followed up by Dr. Bob Pux, uh, who will be dealing with climate change and the galactic weather system. Then we're going to have a culture panel after a small break with uh, a musician that, that, that's been working with our organization for decades, Fred Hink, uh, from Toronto, who's going to give a presentation called Dvorak's Fight to Save the Soul of America. Uh, and then Christine Corey will give a presentation called What is Beautiful Art and Is There a Purpose to Which We Seek It Out? We're going to have a, a dinner break after that for about an hour um, where we'll have something served, uh, probably some spaghetti or something, and then we're going to have a final philosophy panel in the evening. Now, in the process of being eliminated. That's what the British Empire wants to stop. That's what Obama is deploying to stop. That's what the, the, the head of NATO and all of his insanity is deploying to stop. It's nothing about the nations of China or the nation of Russia, per se. And they're deploying to stop this, even at the risk of unleashing thermonuclear war on the planet. Now, that's insane. And you know, any normal person would say, why? Why? Why would they do that? What warrants the possible extinction of mankind? But this tendency represented by the British Empire and their lackey Obama, this tendency within civilization of oligarchy and the, the, the commitment to maintaining the system of oligarchy is not new. This is not a creature of the 20th or 21st century. This is something which is very ancient within mankind. And you have a very clear, um, a very clear image and expression of this conflict between man, mankind, and oligarchy in the story of Zeus and Prometheus. The, the myth that comes to us from ancient Greece, which isn't really a myth at all. And Matt, you can put the first slide up on the screen there. So here you see, um, okay, here you see uh, on the left, in DC area office of the Rouge Pack on the, the Rouge Pack science team. And I'd like to start by underscoring um, the, what was really a major theme in Pim's briefing and presentation, which is the crucial point about today's global strategic situation. And that is, you know, look at what is actually happening in Eurasia. You look at the fact that over the past two to three decades, China has lifted 600 million people out of poverty. That's almost twice the current U.S. population. And I, I looked this up. This is more than 15 times the population of Canada. Um, you look at the fact that over the past couple of years, China has established a new development bank, the Asia Infrastructure Develop uh, Investment Bank, which currently has 70 member nations, including many nations of Europe. And by the end of the year, it expects to have 30 more. The AIIB is a uh, development bank with no conditionalities explicitly to make loans to development projects to facilitate China's One Belt, One Road and, and sister projects. Now, think about these projects. We, we didn't talk about any of them explicitly today, but you, you can find out much more. Just, just think about the scale of the projects that are currently underway or, or will very shortly be underway in Eurasia. There are many, many more I could mention. India just announced they're going to begin um, a plan for the develop uh, for water transfer programs <coughs> among five major rivers in India. This is something which has been on the books for decades, which Mr. LaRouche talked about in the 1980s. India just announced that they're um, about to begin this kind of water management uh, large-scale water management project. It's akin to the projects which are happening just over the Himalayas in China with their south-to-north water transfer project. 
So I, I can name many, many more, but I wanted to describe some of them so you let your imagination picture this growing, very rapidly growing integration of the nations and the peoples of Eurasia around the policy of peace, of development. That is what these missile installments in Eastern Europe of NATO, of, of soldiers from the United States, from, from Germany, from other nations, that is what these war policies are being deployed to stop, right? This, the idea that a new system could come into being which is outside of geopolitics and which is outside of the control of the British Empire where nations are acting on their common interests, common benefits, meaning that all of those trigger points of geopolitics are being dissolved. Anything that could have been used as a lever to set one people against the other is now you see Prometheus, the fire bringer. And on the right you see Zeus reclining on his throne with his foot on uh, the eagle, which is the symbol of Zeus. And as most people are probably familiar with, with the story, but just to kind of reiterate it, Zeus was the king of the gods of Mount Olympus, the king of the immortals. And he came to power by overthrowing his father Kronos with the help of Prometheus, who, uh, Prometheus who wanted to end the tyranny of Kronos. Now, Zeus hated mankind. And... Um, as it's put by the playwright Aeschylus in his, um, in his play, Prometheus Bound. He describes this in the mouth of Prometheus. Prometheus says, of wretched mortals, humans, of wretched mortals, Zeus took no notice. He desired to bring the whole race to an end and to create a new one in its place. And against this purpose, None dared to make stand except me. I only had the courage. I saved mortals so that they did not descend, blasted utterly to the house of Hades. This is why I am bent by such grievous tortures, painful to suffer, piteous to behold. And so Prometheus saved mankind by stealing fire from Mount Olympus. For example, last year you had the opening of an upgraded rail line which runs from the city of Chongqing in China, which is just south of the ancient city of Xi'an, the beginning of the Silk Road. It runs from there in central China, west through the desert of China. It runs through nations in Central Asia, such as Kazakhstan. It runs through a part of Russia. It runs through countries in Eastern Europe, like Poland, all the way into Germany, to the western part of Germany, and ends in the industrial city of Duisburg. Now, can you imagine that in your mind, right? And that's just one of many projects. Just this year, China opened a rail link between um, China and Tehran. Now, that's complementary to other projects which are just getting underway. For example, there was just an agreement signed between Iran, India, and Afghanistan. Now think for a moment about the condition of Afghanistan. There was just a joint agreement signed to develop a new port in the city of Chabahar, which is in the southeast of Iran, right on the Gulf of Oman. Now this is going to be a maritime connection between India and other nations on the Indian Ocean, up into a uh, rail link going from Chabahar to the border of, of Iran and Afghanistan, opening up Afghanistan to be developed, to have access to trade, to have access to rail connections up into central Eurasia. 